is good, his mercy endures forever. This is Faith Matters with Philip Campbell, a Catholic variety program broadcasting on Good Shepherd Catholic Radio out of Jackson, Michigan. And hello, everyone. I am Philip Campbell. I'm your host for the day, as always, and we're going to be talking about some real good stuff today. And I want to begin with a, uh, with a passage from the New Testament book of Romans, a very, a very dense book, very theologically packed uh, book, the longest letter of St. Paul. We're going to go to chapter 2, start at verse 14. And here Paul says, he's talking about the Gentiles, that is the people who were outside the Jewish covenant, the, the, the nations at large. He says, quote, when the Gentiles who do not have the law keep it as by instinct, these men, although without the law, serve as a law unto themselves. They show that the demands of the law are written in their hearts. Their conscience bears witness together with that law, and their thoughts will accuse or defend them on that day when in accordance with the gospel, God will pass judgment on the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. That is second uh, chapter of Romans, verses 14 through 16. And he's talking about the subject of today's program, which is conscience. He's saying, he, he's drawing this contrast, says, look, the Jews... Uh, we have the Ten Commandments. Uh, we have these various revelations from God that say, like, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, and so on. And he points out that the other nations, they, don't, they didn't have a revelation from God. They did not have God coming down on a mountain saying, hey, do this, don't do that. But nevertheless, even in the Gentile nations, there's still a moral code that, that on a very fundamental level, agrees with uh, the revelation of God to the Jews, at least on the basics. I mean, even the pagan Romans thought that stealing was wrong. Even the, the, the pagan Gauls thought that adultery was wrong. You know, uh, there was a, a kind of universal consensus. And he says, even though they didn't have the law, they kept it as through, as through instinct to show that the demands of the law were written in their hearts and their conscience bears witness, their thoughts accusing or defending them on the day of judgment. That is how well, that is how well those pagans lived up to the things that they knew or thought to be good. That's what will accuse or excuse them on the day of judgment. And what St. Paul is talking about is conscience. And we hear about conscience all the time, about following your conscience, about having a clear conscience, a well-formed conscience, about I can't in good conscience do this or that. What is conscience, and how do we interact with conscience? How does it affect our moral decisions? Uh, if we start at the Catechism, paragraph 1776, the Catechism says, quote, deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself, but which he must obey. Its voice, ever calling him to love, and to do what is good and to avoid evil sounds in his heart at the right moment. For man has in his heart a law inscribed by God. His conscience is man's most secret core and his sanctuary. There he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in his depths. That's a beautiful passage, and it's a quote from the, uh, from the document Gaudium et Spes, of the Second Vatican Council, talking about the conscience of man. And it really, it really brings home the point that conscience is a kind of natural revelation. Okay, We talk about divine revelation being when God supernaturally makes his will known to mankind, as in when he you know, speaks from Mount Sinai, or in the person of Jesus Christ, or in some supernatural manifestation. But conscience is a kind of natural revelation. Every individual has a conscience uh, just by, by nature. And as the Catechism says, in our conscience, we discover a law that we have not laid upon ourselves, but which we feel driven to obey. It is like a voice ever calling us to do good and avoid evil. In the cartoons, like in the, <clears throat> in the old Looney, Tune, Looney Tunes uh, programs, they'd, they would show, you know, like the little angel on the shoulder 
representing the voice of conscience, and then the little devil on the other shoulder representing the voice of temptation. And that, uh, I mean, that's kind of a childish way to describe it, but like many childish representations, it's profoundly truthful. Uh, Conscience is very much like a voice inside of us, a still small voice, and it very much does strive against the suggestions that we feel uh, tempted to through our proclivity to sin. So conscience is a kind of natural revelation of God to us. It's a way that God kind of uh, prompts every one of us, no matter where you're born, no matter what religion you are, uh, whatever your circumstance in life, we have a conscience that kind of goads us on to do good and avoid evil. And that's the fundamental kind of natural revelation that God leaves with us. Now, it falls to grace and to the Christian revelation, the Christian dispensation, to take that raw material, that unformed clay of that primal natural revelation, do good and avoid evil, and to flesh that out into all the various, you know, the various commandments and the the sophisticated moral and ethical system of Christianity. But at the base, most basic level, we all have this natural revelation deep within us, this voice that says, do good, avoid evil. And this is our this is our conscience. Now, in general, in general, the conscience in our heart is what is what tells us at a certain moment to do good and to avoid that which is evil. But in particular, it is what passes judgment on our particular choices. It approves us when we do something good and denounces us when we do something evil. It is your conscience that feels bad. That, that disapproves when you do something that you know you shouldn't be doing. That is the judgment of a guilty conscience. Why do we feel a guilty conscience? Uh, well, remember, we are all ordered towards the good. God has ordered us by nature to happiness, to, to happiness in, in heaven uh, and beatitude with God. And so when we do something that is contrary to that end, we, we tend to feel the pangs of, uh, of conscience. So because of this, because this is bound up with the ends that God has created us for, when we listen to our conscience, in a way we can hear God speaking to us. So what is the definition of conscience? Well, conscience is a judgment. It's a judgment of reason whereby we recognize that our actions have a moral quality. Whether it's a, a, a act that we are going to perform, that we're in the process of performing, or that we've already completed. Any action that we do, are doing, or have done, it's a kind of judgment on the moral quality of that action. In everything we say and everything we do, we have an obligation to follow our conscience, to follow what we know, or think we know, to be just and right. And that is really how we live out the divine law in our daily lives. How do we actually, concretely, in the day-to-day decisions we make, live out the will, the divine law of God? It's by following our conscience and doing the things we know to be just and good and avoiding the things we know to be evil. Now, to do that, that obviously necessitates a certain sort of reflectiveness, uh, it's said that among the ancient Greeks at the the oracle at the temple of Delphi, which was the temple to Apollo, who was the god of wisdom and light, that over the door of that temple there was an inscription that just said, Know thyself. And even though the Greeks were pagans, they had this fundamental truth with them that uh, that life needs to be examined, that we need to reflect upon our actions, upon our lives, that life calls for a certain sufficient uh, interiority. And the Catechism says this as well. In paragraph 1779, it says, it's important for every person to be sufficiently present to himself in order to hear and follow the voice of conscience. And this is why those of us who, I hope, I hope all of you who are listening, who, who go to the sacrament of confession, why we sit quietly and do, what is that thing we do before we go to confession? An examination of conscience, right? When you're doing an examination of conscience, you're sitting there quietly and letting your conscience speak to you. It's like a voice. It's like a voice through which we hear the divine prescriptions of God. What is it saying to us? We sit in silence. 
So to be in tune with our conscience, we have to have a certain sort of reflectiveness, a certain interiority. St. Augustine writes, quote, Return to your conscience, question it, turn inward, brethren, and in everything you do, see God as your witness. So we turn inward, looking for what our conscience bears witness of. Now, all well and good, but you're going to say, Philip, but the problem is conscience can tell us different things, right? One person's conscience can say it's wrong to eat animals, and another person's conscience can say it's fine to eat animals. One person's conscience can say, there's no problem with me smoking. Another person's conscience can say, how could you possibly smoke knowing how, how bad that is for you? One person's conscience doesn't have any, any problem picking up some grapes off of the cluster at the grocery store and tasting them to see if they're any good. Another person uh, says, I can't taste a single grape if I haven't paid for it. That would be stealing. So people's conscience often disagree on the details. It can tell us different things. Uh, some people can justify amazing acts of evil with their, their conscience. They can, they can rationalize things to where, where horrific things seem to be justified or where they try to at least justify them to themselves. Now, uh, the dignity of the human person really implies, if we, if we have a human dignity, if we're made in the image and likeness of God and we have dignity, this requires that our conscience must be upright, that it must be rightly formed, okay? Uh, so the conscience is what tells us do good and avoid evil, but we have, we have an obligation to rightly form that conscience. We have to be able to perceive the principles of morality. We have to understand how to apply them in given circumstances and have uh, practical discernment about the reasons for all these different things. And we have to be able to make judgments about, uh, about the actions that we perform or will perform in the future. That is, we have to cultivate the virtue of prudence, the virtue of recognizing the good and choosing it. That's what prudence is. The prudent person is he who can recognize what is good in a particular situation and choose to pursue that good. Okay, so... Conscience, uh, conscience needs to be formed, right? We have the capacity for our conscience to, to tell us these things, but we have to form it rightly. We don't want to have a malformed conscience, or we don't want to have a dead conscience. A dead conscience is when we've committed so many evils that we're no longer shocked by them anymore. We've stolen so much that we no longer bat an eye when we steal. Uh, we've killed so much that we can take human life without it bothering us. That's when your conscience is snuffed out by the enormity of the sins we've created. And short of a intervention by God's grace, it's very difficult to awaken conscience once it's been deadened. And so what this means is that conscience is related to responsibility. We have a responsibility to cultivate the virtue of prudence to form our conscience correctly. Think about this. People can do something wrong, you know? People can, people can do something bad, but it's worse when they know better. Do you know what I mean? It's worse when they know better. Think about, uh, think about someone who has a cognitive disability, a, an impairment where they, they can't control themselves, or they're not in their right mind, Right? Somebody who maybe has, uh, maybe can't exercise the use of reason, maybe they're mentally impaired, or they have involuntary movements of their body. And let's say that person is near you, and they have an involuntary movement of their body, and they, they knock something over on you, they knock a cup of coffee on your lap, right? Uh, is that person responsible for that? Like, do you get mad at them? Are they responsible for what they did? You understand that they're not. You have compassion on them because you know that they, wh why? When a, if a mentally impaired person who can't control their, their bodily movements knocks a cup of coffee in your lap, why, why don't you get angry at them? Why don't you think that they are guilty of doing something wrong? Is it not because you know that they don't know any better or that they can't control what they did? The act of knowing better is what gives something a moral quality to it. Now compare that... Compare that with a situation where someone who is completely in their right mind, completely in full control of all their faculties in their body, walks up to you and intentionally knocks the coffee on your lap. Now, 
fascinating because they've done the exact same thing. In the first scenario and the second one, they've both knocked coffee on your lap. But the second one you get angry at, that person is morally responsible. Why? Because the second person ought to know better. You should know better than to do that. That's talking about conscience, right? Uh, Responsibility is greater to the degree that we know better. Should I throw in the Spider-Man line? With great power comes great responsibility. It's true. The more we know, the more responsible we are and the more accountable we are. So conscience enables us to assume responsibility for our actions. If someone commits evil, the just judgment of conscience can remain with them as the witness to the universal truth of what is good. There's this, there's this uh, Edgar Allan Poe story, right? The, uh, the telltale heart. In that story, the, the protagonist, I can't remember his name, he, he kills somebody and, and buries them. And he's like, ha-ha, I got away with murder. But he keeps hearing that heart beating. The, the victim's heart continues to beat. At first it's faint, but it gets louder and louder until he can't, uh, until he can't deal with it anymore. And he breaks down and confesses his crime. That, the beating of that heart is representative of the power of conscience. That in the, in, the, uh, in the nonstop beating and drumming into his head, it's a constant testimony of what is good. That you ought not to have killed. You ought not to have killed. Thou shalt not kill. And until he can't deal with it anymore. Another great book, if you have uh, enough time and fortitude to read Russian literature, is Crime and Punishment, which is a much greater, uh, longer story on the same, the, the, the same theme, on a man slowly being driven crazy by the pangs of conscience over murders that he committed. So it bears witness to the truth of the good and the evil of a person's particular choice. So, um, are we obliged to act in accord with conscience then? The answer, of course, is yes. We have to act in accord with our conscience, and we should have the freedom to do so. It's considered, or at least the church considers it, an offense against human dignity to force somebody to act against their conscience. Conscience is an exercise of freedom. It's the freedom for me to evaluate my own moral actions and to, to judge myself, right? To judge what I should do in pursuit of the good. If you, through external coercion, through a law or something like that, try to force me to act against your conscience, you are impairing my human freedom on a very fundamental level. Man must not be prevented from acting according to his conscience, especially in religious matters, especially in religious matters which pertain so closely to our our, our understanding of what is good, of, of what constitutes our own happiness and, uh, and salvation. This is really what was at the heart of those controversies about, you, you hear these stories like, oh, Christian Baker, uh, you know, doesn't want to, doesn't want to make a wedding cake for a gay wedding, you know, and people misunderstand what this is about. They think it's about like, well, Christians hate homosexual people and they don't want to, they don't want to, uh, you know, be kind to, to homosexuals. It was never about that. It was about these these people who were put in these dilemmas were having a, a issue of con- uh, of religious conscience where they're saying, if if I do this action, will I be supporting an act that in my conscience I think is morally evil? And will I be guilty before God for supporting something that goes against my conscience? That would That's what it was always about. It was never about the 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 gay couple that wanted the cake or or hating them it was about the individual baker's conscience before god and to what degree he felt he or she feels they can cooperate in an action that goes against conscience or similar to when like a religious order that owns a hospital is compelled by law to offer access to abortion things like that these are all matters of of conscience uh matters that 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 touch on these this, this problem of using law to try to compel people to go against their conscience in religious matters. Okay, so <clears throat> we mentioned earlier that people's consciences can diverge, even on big things, like just talking about abortion. Some people, you know, think abortion is fine, and some people believe it's murder. That's a pretty big divergence of, of conscience. Um, so conscience can diverge, but but that's kind of deceptive, okay? Because people will say, hey, there, there is no natural law. You can't say there's some sort of uniform 
code of morality that everyone believes in on the planet and that everybody just kind of implicitly knows because if there was, you wouldn't have some people saying abortion is okay and other people's Uh, other people saying it's not okay. You wouldn't have some people saying slavery is okay and other people saying no, it's not. Some people saying polygamy, yes. Other people saying polygamy, no. If If there was a natural law, you wouldn't have these divergencies. However, I would argue that there is a sort of uniformity to human conscience. Um, even if there are variations, and I'm going to defer to to C.S. Lewis, who wrote about this uh, extensively in his book, The Abolition of Man, he points out that there really is a kind of uniformity to conscience, even though it varies around the edges. For example, um, you might look at one culture that says you can have four wives, and another culture that says you can only have one wife, but there's no culture that says you can just have anyone you want, right? They Every human moral code has some sort of uh, some sort of prescription for this is my spouse. They might disagree on how many you can have, but they're, but that's universal. This is a special person who's consecrated to me by the bonds of matrimony, right? Now, you might have one culture that says, uh, you might have one culture that says a certain act is cowardly, and you might have another culture that says, oh, no, that isn't, that isn't so bad. Like, like some cultures, warrior cultures, it's cowardly to ever run away in battle, right? You never run. You never run. Other cultures, their military history, they have tactical retreats, and that's fine. But you never have any culture in human history that celebrates cowardice, that says, yes, we exalt cowardice. We, we, love, we love cowardice. We love traitors. No, nobody thinks those things are good, Okay, you'll have cultures and moral codes disagreeing on when, uh, when, if at all, it's justified to take something that doesn't belong to you. Like if you're starving, can you steal bread? You'll have disagreements about that, but you don't have any culture that says stealing is good, that, that you can just steal from anyone. So when you start looking at the big picture, you see that there is a sort of uniform moral code across the human species uh, that diverges on particulars. But there's definitely a sort of uniformity, and C.S. Lewis goes into this a lot in The Abolition of Man. So there is a sort of natural law, and our conscience becomes more refined to the degree that we build on that, that we build on the natural law. Um, And so the conscience must be formed, moral judgment must be enlightened, so that it's upright, so that it's truthful, so that we're formulating our judgments in accord with reason, and uh, in conformity with what God wills for us. And so this means that the education of our conscience, it's, it's indispensable, indispensable for human beings if we want to be well-rounded people, because, I mean, gosh, we are so subjected to negativity, to negative influences out there in the world, tempted by sin. Uh, it's so easy to prefer our own judgment over what we know to be good and true. We really need to actively work at cultivating our conscience. The education of conscience is a lifelong task. And this is why as Christians, we we form our conscience in light of what we learn from the Word of God, from that special divine revelation. We take what God implants in our heart by natural, by the natural revelation of conscience, and we refine it with the light of grace and divine revelation from, from the Word of God. We assimilate the teaching of God through prayer, through meditation, and we put it into practice. And the Holy Spirit will help us to do these things. And this is what this is what brings us peace. Have you ever noticed how good it is, how good it feels to have a good conscience, right? Like, think about you're at work, you're at work, and your boss comes out and he calls you in there, Jones, get in here! And he's not happy, and you, you very quickly think, have I done anything? And you think, and you know, you know in your heart you haven't done anything. And you think, ah, okay, I can deal with this. I didn't do anything. <laughs> right? Versus, I mean, that's a great feeling, having a clean conscience. But think about this. Remember this feeling when you did something bad at school? Like maybe you cheated. Maybe you, you, you did something. I don't know. You, you did something you weren't supposed to be doing. And then you're in class, and the teacher says, uh, Jimmy, I need to see you after class. And your heart just sinks you know, you're like, oh, she knows I cheated, right? 
oh, she knows what I did. And that, that sinking feeling, oh, <laughs> they know, they know what I did. Oh man, having a clean conscience is so uplifting and it, it, there's nothing quite like it. That's why it feels great coming out of confession. You ever talk to people that come out of confession and they're like, I feel 10 pounds lighter. Like literally, I feel that way sometimes. There's nothing as great and as peaceful as the peace of a good conscience. Okay, so here's some ground rules for conscience, and then we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, the church proposes, uh, first, because conscience isn't always clear-cut. Sometimes, uh, you know, even in the be- even the best form, conscience doesn't know what to do in a given situation. It can be hard to decide what the best route is. So a couple, uh, three rules. Number one, we should never do evil so that good can result of it. We never say, well... I'm going to do evil so that I can have a good outcome. The ends do not justify the means, and so uh, never do evil so that good may result of it. Number two, follow the golden rule, which uh, from the scriptures is, whatever you wish that men would do to you, do so to them. Always treat others in a way that you would wish to be treated. And the third one is that always respect uh, your neighbor and always respect his conscience. So if you cause your brother to stumble, that is, if you cause scandal, you are wounding your brother's conscience. You are wounding someone else's conscience. So therefore, the catechism says, uh, or quote, I'm sorry, not the catechism, the book of Romans, chapter 14, verse 21, it is right not to do anything that makes your brother stumble. Okay? So just start with these three things. There's so much more we could say about conscience, but if we start with these three things, we will do well. Number one, Never do evil so good may result of it. Number two, whatsoever you wish men would do to you, do also to them. And number three, don't do anything that makes your brother stumble. Those are the three starting points. So I think that's uh, that's probably enough for now. We could go on. We'll probably revisit the subject in the future. But I think that's probably good for now. So this has been another episode of Faith Matters. I'm your host, Philip Campbell. Thank you so much for joining me. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look kindly upon you and give you peace. God bless you, my friends.